All right, so my project is triage scales for evaluating mental health presentations in the emergency department. It's a literature review, a little less of a creative piece, um, but I was advised by Dr. Thompson in the psychology department. So to jump right into it here, I think a lot of people can relate to this emergency department overcrowding that's become increasingly prevalent in our society. And even more concerning is our folks with mental health crises, which is what this project really uh, keys in on in the emergency room. So to give you more quantifiable data, uh, about one in eight visits to the emergency department, at least in this country, are for a mental health related concern, which adds up to about 6.4 million. To add insult to injury, the wait time's going up, more demand, increased wait time. And to highlight that this wait time is just to see any sort of provider in the emergency department. Uh, so that might not be the correct level of care. Uh, usually a psychiatry consult is warranted. And in both the popular and scholarly literature, we've seen uh, the repercussions of this. So, you know, a woman waits an hour, which is about the average wait time, <laughs> and ends up fatally shooting herself. Um, emergency department restrooms uh, have become alarms now as areas where people are committing suicide after coming in. To give you more of a visual look at the data, so I'm not supposed to leave this mic, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, laser pointer. I was like, oh, when I do my presentation, I'll be walking around. No, I won't. Here, holding on for dear life. Uh, so if you look at the green line, uh, all those mood disorders, you've seen a 55.5% cumulative increase. This is from 2006 to 2013 when the latest da data is available. And we have a similar increase in psychoses or the bipolar disorders. Uh, my project does not specifically look at the substance use disorders, uh, the SUDs, that's that middle blue line. Uh, we have the least steady rise in those disorders, but still increasing overall. And my hope was that as we have more of these presentations and we expand our practice settings, uh, acute settings, urgent care sites, that these guidelines would be applicable to all those different places. So with all that uplifting data, um, triage has been hypothesized as a remedy to emergency department overcrowding. And so just to situate this in the context of what other people have done, a very traditional research sense here, uh, we have a lot of great research on medical emergency triage scales. Uh, the emergency severity index is very common in emergency rooms. That's a simple one to five scale. One, you're doing CPR actively. Five, you're giving them a Band-Aid. We're not really sure why they came to the ER. Uh, so there's been a lot of research on that. There was a new study in 2016. Michael Christ and his team added to the breadth of work on vital sign data in medical emergency triage. Others have looked specifically at alcohol screening tools, which allowed me to take those out when I did my project. Um, and there's also the closest thing that I could find to the project that I was proposing uh, was Randall's group who looked at self-harm assessments. And the biggest thing that I can glean from his work is he was able to quantify that clinical judgment isn't always the best. I think a lot of times as a scapegoat, um, we say, you know, you do these measures and you hope they work and then you look at it in a holistic sense and use your best clinical judgment. And he said, there's bias inherent in clinical judgment. We have to have better measures. So this project, I was looking at, so what, what mental health triage tools do we have? I expanded it to a global context to compile these and which are doing the best job. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about how I identified best. Are there similarities and differences? Uh, you know, where are the gaps in the existing research? I wanted this to serve as a database for people who were uh, looking to revise or create or further investigate mental health triage systems. And at the same time, if that removes some of the stigma associated with those disorders directly, uh, it would be a wonderful added benefit. <laughs> So as most psychiatric research and uh, medical literature reviews, I followed the PRISMA guidelines, the preferred reporting items uh, for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So there's a visual overview um, of the PRISMA guidelines. It starts with database searching, removing duplicates, and then screening records first by title, next by abstract, finally by full text, and then analyzing them. Uh, so to give you a quick idea of the methodology just summarized in this chart, uh, I was looking at adult patients only because uh, there's a lot of inherent uh, confounders in the presentations of pediatric and geriatric patients. I used five outcome variables in deciding what's the best. So I looked at hospitalization, interrater reliability, internal consistency, concurrent validity, and the predictive validity of future adverse psychiatric presentations. And I'll discuss each of those a little more uh, in the results, and you know they had to have a control group and be a be a decent study. 
So it's kind of a three-part slide. You can look at the databases. They're really common in psychiatric care. Um, I also wanted to eliminate publication bias, so I did a search of the what we call the gray literature things that didn't work so that no one ever published them because they didn't want their name attached to something that didn't work. Uh, but that was really important for this study to know what tools didn't work so that we stopped researching those. <laughs> Uh, so I included clinical trials that haven't yet been published and the first five pages of Google Scholar. I was very successful in finding many articles related to this research question. Uh, after duplicates removed, you can see the numbers. Um, ultimately, 38 are included in the synthesis. Also, with the PRISMA guidelines, and I've just highlighted in red, I don't expect you to read all the text. I know it's early. Um, you have to code why you eliminated things. So to get from 4,000 down to 38, I had to have a systemic reason as to why I didn't think those studies were particular to these research questions. Uh, so whether it was the population, uh, it wasn't a psychiatric medical condition. I was looking at in-person triage in the acute setting. No matter how many times I adjusted my search terms, I got a lot of nursing awards, and those always got eliminated. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of the results, um, for each of those five variables, I made a table like this, which is similar to how uh, Randall et al. presented the results in their paper. And so I've just given you an example of one here with the sample size, the year, the primary author. If you look just at this, only two of those studies are in the United States. So for the 38 that I had, I thought it would be interesting to plot them around the world. Um, so just the black stars, if you can see, are where the studies took place. So I think more important from this diagram is just where we have no research, um, all of Russia, you know, South America, um, interesting government priorities. So for the results beyond the different uh, cultural context that you can imagine would let mental health present differently in different settings, I had these five variables. And the number there is the number of studies with that outcome category. So there were 14 in hospitalization. What I've highlighted on the results, the paper is really long. If you want to read it, I'll, I'll give it to you. But I thought I'd highlight some important things for a general audience maybe things that sounded the most promising. Um, the brief psychiatric rating scale, I thought hospitalization was an important outcome variable because uh, it's in many cases in psychiatric crises, you're holding people against their will. So we, we hope we're doing something right before we incur a lot of trauma. Um, so there were only two studies. Uh, that was some of the few overlap that I saw for this. They actually took place 12 years apart. One was in Norway and one was in the United States. The older study out of the United States, uh, as Americans think, they had solved the problem. They drew a cutoff line at 39. That had an 86% sensitivity and specificity, um, so that if people scored a 39 or above on this questionnaire, this triage measure, um, then they should be hospitalized. And we had really good data that we were doing the right thing. The later study in 2010 said, yeah, there's a correlation, but we, we don't think it's that clear cut. <laughs> So definitely more work for research there. Interrater reliability was another variable, um, because if you have a good measure, you should get a clear consensus no matter who I give it to uh, to complete the measure. And that's especially for the low resource settings where we don't have a lot of research. High measures on interrater reliability would be helpful. So a study by Hatcher had a really unique idea in that they compared patients and clinicians' ratings which we usually don't have. We have a lot of comparing clinicians and clinicians, you know, the nurse versus the psychiatrist, the physician assistant versus the attending. Um, and they found that clinicians habitually underestimate uh, how would patients would rank themselves. And the hypothesis that they suggested in their paper was that clinicians are worried about being sued. And so if they make their patients seem less severe, they're less likely to be held accountable um, later on. Another kind of challenge to that, which I found a lot in the paper, is that psychiatric nurses who would have more training than other triage nurses in the emergency department, they were also giving patients lower scores. So interesting points there. Um, internal consistency of a measure, there are only six studies here. It's just how similar the score on different questions targeting the same thing. So loss of interest and sadness, if I ask two separate questions, I should get a similar answer for both of those. Um, and the way that this is measured is the Kronbach's alpha value, which I've listed up there. Um, one is like a perfect correlation, so you get the same answer on both uh, questions. So again, for future research, we have what the highest and what the lowest is. Uh, concurrent validity, 
This is just, you know, we have new measures. How are they lining up with our old measure? An interesting something to take away here is that the three item version uh, of the patient safety screen aligned a lot better with the Beck scale for suicide ideation, which is a really popular one that we know is good. Uh, and then predictive validity of adverse uh, psychiatric presentations, and these were nine times out of 10 harm to others versus harm to self. This is one of the ones where research supports a time and time again a cutoff score, which is really what we like to see. If someone has on this scale a score of 30 or above at baseline, um, there's an over 86% chance that they will uh, repeat a suicide attempt. So in this, I was looking at a lot of sensitivity and specificity, that a, a positive test is really a true positive, specificity that a negative test is a true negative, and usually you have one at the cost of another. Um, and in the case of suicidal presentations, I'm okay with the sensitivity being higher. So future resource, uh, something that I can say conclusively out of a lot of things that got compiled together without the major conclusions I was hoping for, is that we know having an instrument itself, so a triage measure versus not, is helpful. Um, we really need multi-dimensional approaches that look at all five of those areas that I talked about. We want to generate confidence in what we do know and create replicable results in multiple different contexts. Um, I always say healthcare needs everyone. We need multiple perspectives. Uh, in different contexts, and hopefully this database serves as, as a jumping point for that. So I think I left it as questions. I'll be around for the day if people want to have them, because I know <laughs> Megan, we have a tough timeline. We've got a minute and a half for questions. Yeah, I don't see any. I don't <laughs> 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 no, if not, but I don't know, that took about a fourth of the time that people would have waited in the ER, so <laughs> that should be good.